It was a long time ago, Amy, when began a story of a love so pure, so powerful, that in hindsight could only have been ordained, perhaps destined, by God himself. Of strange events, signs, and wonders, amidst recurring dreams of a future daughter, and my five-year odyssey to find your would-be mother, who would at last reside in a land so far away that, to me, almost seemed mythical. A land somewhere over the rainbow. It is a story of my love for your mother, and her once equal love for me, a love through which you could only have been conceived and born. A love I once carved in stone, amidst greater stones, laid upon the earth by giants, those biblical men of renown. August 11, 2019. Along with your grandfather at the wheel of his Ford Explorer, I set out to return to the place where I had once carved my name and your mother's name in stone, 20 years and one day ago, just before leaving my home and all I knew for Australia to marry your future mother. My destination this day was ultimately a low, rock-strewn hill, 400 meters northeast of the present temple in Manti, Utah, about two-hour drive from Salt Lake City. Apart from you, daughter, so little now remains to attest to that love your mother and I shared that I am compelled to find the lonely rock on a windswept hill that bears our names to prove to myself, perhaps, that it had not all just been a fantastic dream, as Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz might have questioned after waking up home in her own gray reality, after her amazing journey over the rainbow. Indeed, if the stone exists, or still exists, it will be one more token to add to the very few that remain after 20 years of life in Australia. The drive to Manti was nearly as I remembered it. Once beyond the bustle and chaos of the expanding cities, the construction and congestion not much had changed in the two decades I had been gone. Wide open land, farms, and timeless towns nestled among sage-covered valleys amidst high desert mountains. I was pleased to see our American flag waving gently in the hot summer breeze from so many homes and shops. Americana seemingly preserved in isolation from the steamroller of socialism and anti-Americanism polluting the larger cities affirming to me that our constitution and American values, morals, and the patriotism of my forebears were still alive where it mattered most, in the hearts and practices of good people. The further away from the cities we drove, the more I felt at one with my country as I remembered it. through the peaceful Utah countryside approached its end as the towering alabaster Manti Temple came into view, standing boldly upon a hill and glowing brilliant in the late morning sun, signaling that we had arrived to our destination. 
and just to the east of it rose the small unnamed rocky hill that I had traveled here to revisit after so many years away. As we drove casually along the main street of the long established town of Manti, I thought of the history of the town as I had read of it many years ago. Manti, Utah, located on Heritage Highway 89 between Gunnison and Ephraim, was one of the first communities settled in what would later become the state of Utah. Chief Wakara, a Ute tribe leader friendly to the Mormon, had petitioned then church president Brigham Young to send pioneers to the area in order to teach the Utes techniques in farming. In November of 1849, with winter fast approaching, Brigham Young sent a group of around 225 settlers, men, women, and their children, to establish a colony in the region. After some debate, it had been decided to settle on the south side of a sparse gray hill on which would later be built the future Manti Temple, still some two and a half decades away. In his booklet, The Miracle of the Mountains, William H. Peterson provided a description of the hardships facing those settlers through that first winter. Quote, the primitive settlement thus established was in reality a cluster of pioneer wagons grouped together for protection in the midst of rank underbrush. It occupied a small speck of ground amidst thousands of square miles of rugged mountains and virgin valley where the only living things were wild animals, strange plants, and tribes of savages. Each wagon was home for a family, serving as a kitchen, dining room, bedroom, and parlor. It was protected from the elements only by a sheet of cloth stretched over the bow of the wagon box. Hardly had the circle of wagons been established and a few trails made through the surrounding underbrush when snow began to fall, obliterating the trails and covering the ground to a depth of two feet. Freezing weather followed crusting the snow and covering the streams with ice. A long, hard winter was ahead of these settlers, a winter in which most of their cattle were to starve or freeze." Unquote. I had often thought of such settlers during my time in the Australian prison, after being so cruelly, unlawfully ripped away from you. Though terrible on me at times, confined and heartbroken, missing you so much, my prison cell was a luxurious apartment compared to what those pioneers willingly endured out of faith and determination. Not long after the winter had set in, the pioneers decided to abandon their wagon shelter and dig shallow tunnels into the side of the gray hill in order to better ward off the cold. But no sooner had they begun to dig that they realized the hill was all but made of stone, taking them three days to dig out their respective shelters. Then, when the warm springtime finally arrived, they were struck by a plague of rattlesnakes that had also wintered in the hill. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of snakes slithered out of their dens, infesting the small settlement wherever one might step. Using torches and guns and anything they could find, the rattlesnakes were eventually destroyed. Miraculously, not one person, not even a young curious child, had been bitten. There was something special about that hill that those first pioneers could not have envisioned then, but that it would, in a future time, become the very spot on which Manti Temple would be built. I had long thought it symbolic how these weary, hungry, but faithful pioneers had met and defeated the serpent in his own lair, as if in preparation to cleanse the location for a temple they knew not would one day be built there. As the young settlement stabilized through the summer months, children found pleasure in combing the hills and collecting arrowheads and stones for games, and finding an abundance of fossilized shells and tracks of all sorts of now extinct creatures. Lovers would stroll upon the hill collecting wildflowers, and when the winter returned, the children and even adults would enjoy sledding down the steep mountain slope.
Through the ensuing years, the small settlement grew from a ragged, struggling camp into a vibrant, successful town. Plots of land had been allotted to each family, and a fort would eventually be built. Then, in 1877, after much debate and contemplation, Brigham Young declared that a temple should be built on the very hill where the original group of pioneers had first settled. It was a choice made in part due to the abundance of quarry stone available in and around the hill as the pioneers had once discovered the hard way. In April of that year, 1877, excavation for the new Manti Temple began. It took 11 years to complete under tremendous cost and labor of many men and women and skills from all walks. But in May of 1888, the new Manti Temple was officially dedicated over a three-day period. Today, one can barely imagine that the hill, now called Temple Hill, had once been a stark, snake-infested shelter for a relative handful of Mormon faithful. As impressive as the temple and the story of Temple Hill is to a lover of history as myself, Mormon or otherwise, I was interested in a different hill one which rose gently to a stony crest some 400 meters northeast of the temple, a hill which I had more than 20 years ago come to believe once held a temple or an ancient structure so old that God himself might have all but forgotten of it. And somewhere on that hill hopefully still remained a single rock bearing my name and your mother's name the sole purpose of my return to Manti after all these years away. Leaving Highway 89, we drove down a dusty dirt road beside Temple Hill Campground on the north side of Temple Hill proper, where your grandpa parked the Explorer in the shade of a large tree. I was eager to reach the summit of the rocky hill to the east. I quickly unpacked my camera, grabbed a couple of additional lenses, and began my hike. Your grandpa had sprained his ankle earlier in the week and had reluctantly elected to remain in the vehicle in the shade. Halfway up the hill, I turned and looked back at the explorer parked beneath the tree and suddenly became aware of a deep sense of loneliness. Your grandpa, that is, my dad and I, had covered countless miles together since my childhood, hunting, fishing, searching for arrowheads, artifacts, gemstones, fossils, and even lost treasures together, while discussing and hypothesizing on every subject of mystery and phenomena the world had to offer. My dad had easily climbed this hill with me back in the 90s and had also marveled at the massive stones we both knew were not natural. Accompanying my sense of loneliness was a sense of guilt for having to leave my lifelong adventure partner behind, especially knowing how much he also enjoyed exploring. But I only had this day to find the stone with our names, and now only an hour, maybe, to find it. The day was passing quickly, and due to the August heat, I wouldn't leave my dad sitting in the vehicle too long even in the shade of a large tree. The massive, seemingly hewn and deliberately placed stones began to show through the windswept hill long before reaching the summit, where their unnatural nature appeared more obvious. I grew increasingly anxious to reach the summit, to see it all again after 20 years in Australia. The hike was longer than I remember, and the heat was beginning to wear me down. My heart is not as strong as it had been the last time I saw and held you, Amy. After being taken from you and so unlawfully prisoned, I suffered a near-fatal heart attack on 27 July 2012, due mostly from missing you so very, very much. That heart attack was followed by a cerebral hemorrhage a few months later, causing bleeding into my brain, weakening me further. And just recently, on 30 December of last year, I suffered a stroke and lost the use of my right arm and ability to speak for some time, which doctors had refused to fully examine. 
Like my father waiting in his vehicle below, I was in no physical condition to be hiking up this hot, steep hill today, as I had been twenty years ago, when I had carved your mother's and my name in stone. But I remembered what those pioneers had endured, what should have killed them all, but didn't. Faith and determination. So I climbed. Until, at last, reaching the summit. I searched every rock for the one that bore the names of your mom and your dad, back and forth. But it was nowhere to be found. Neither could I find the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs that had been carved on the side of an overhanging boulder, which many had seen and pondered about. Some believed it to be genuine, put there by ancient Egyptians who had once traveled to and explored the Americas. While I too believed the Egyptians had been in the Americas, as well as Australia, I had come to believe that this particular inscription had been placed there by one of the Mormon workers during the construction of the temple. After all, inside the temple can be found the Egyptian Ankh, symbol of life and Hetep, symbol for peace and tranquility. The quarry, from where the stone was cut to build the temple, was only around a hundred meters away to the west. Maybe the inscription had been obscured by vandals, or perhaps the outcrop had at last broken off and now lay in the bottom of the deep gorge with others that had long since broken away. These are the only photos I have of the hieroglyphs and the area as it had been, taken back in 1999 and used in my book Quest for Peralta Gold, which I had completed in Australia just four days after your birth in 2000, as the foreword in that book recounts. Heartbroken for not finding the rock with mine and your mother's names, which had been the primary reason for my returning here, I turned instead my attention and my camera to the megalithic stones seemingly deliberately placed across the summit of the hill. My day, time, and cost to get here would not be in total vain. Academia will staunchly argue that these stones are a natural geological formation, naturally. But to the trained eye of an alternative thinker and lifelong conspiracy nut as myself, who had long investigated such anomalies, these grand colossal stones are not natural, but rather cut and placed here by an unknown race, now long forgotten, save only in myth or legend, the Nephilim. Those men of renown, the giants of old. And they were likely placed here in an age before the flood.
there is no doubt as to their antiquity, and very similar structures have been found around the world, as in Montana, Russia, Peru, and underwater at Yonaguni. Their similarity is as astonishing as their grandeur. Some of these stones seem to have been deliberately hollowed out into a bowl shape with flat bottoms, the largest being two meters in diameter with a perfectly flat base. Many of them have channels or grooves cut between them, as if to allow liquid to flow from one to another and into another. Such oddities are also found in Russia, Montana, and Yonaguni. What purpose they may have once served one can only guess. Is it possible that the Nephilim used humans to stomp grapes into wine for their consumption? I wouldn't put it past them. It was now afternoon. I'd spent an hour on the summit of the hill, and we still had a long drive back to Salt Lake City. No doubt my dad was growing weary from sitting. So, with great reluctance, I knew it was time to leave. As I started the hike back down to the RV camp where my father patiently waited, I couldn't shake a nagging feeling to search one more time for the rock with your parents' name. Something seemed to whisper in my mind. Look again. Slower. Closer. The feeling was almost impossible to ignore, so, in spite of the late time and the heat, I turned around and searched one last time. I was mentally prepared to give up and call it a day, becoming convinced that it had simply worn away after all these years. And then I saw it, partially hidden beneath a shrub. Oh my God, it's 
still here. What a love story that was. John plus Leah, August 10, 1999. Can't believe it. The last true love story. Our once immeasurable love carved in stone. The names of your mom and dad, Amy. One year before you were born. When love was pure and all that mattered in the whole of the world. There is one more thing you should know, Amy. I had been alone on the hill when I carved our names in that stone. Afterwards, I sat for some time thinking of your mom, our love, and leaving the country I was born to join her in marriage on the other side of the planet. I had felt something powerful and magical and spiritual as I sat there looking over the gorge toward Temple Hill. I felt this region had been sacred for eons before the Mormon temple had been built, and to me, it seemed to emanate from the very hill itself. As I had prepared to leave that day, I looked one more time at the stone with the freshly carved names. What lay ahead for me, over the rainbow, only God knew. But one thing was for certain. You were going to be born to this woman I so deeply loved. You had been my dream, Amy. That is, since November of 1993, you had appeared in my dreams each month while I slept. Those dreams of you, my future daughter, only ended when I had at last met your mother via email on 27 April 1998 under very odd circumstances, confirming to me that she was indeed the one who had become your mother, whom I loved beyond what any words in any language could define. As I prepared to leave the hill that day, I noted a fist-sized rock laying on the ground beside the stone where I had freshly carved our names. I felt compelled to pick it up, indeed, to take it with me, with a promise to the hill that I would one day return it, when I would return with my future daughter, her mother, and our family, in eleven years' time. I carried that rock with me all the way to Australia, giving it to your mother after I arrived on September 2nd, 1999, and told her the story of where it had come from. Your mother had kept that rock in a bowl, along with crystals and other items meaningful to her. You might have recalled seeing it, perhaps even held it out of curiosity. Where that rock is now, only your mother knows. Discarded as garbage, as with all my personal belongings and sentimental items following divorce, I suppose. But she should return the rock. You were conceived and born in the fire of that once intense love, Amy, my daughter. It was a love beyond imagination. I believe it to be the last real fairy tale love story between a man and a woman. That love was sealed within you, Amy, in every fiber of your being, perhaps to protect such a pure and rare emotion from what would come to destroy your mother and I, 11 years later. 
where this love story began, the compelling dreams of your future birth, my lonely five-year journey to find the one who had become your mother, and how and why it came to a tragic end after only 11 years is... Well, Haman Raya, that is a story for another time. If my heart should dare survive to relive it all again, I suppose it should be noted that on the following day, after carving our names on the stone and carrying with me a rock I would give as a gift to your mother, a terrible tornado struck my hometown of Salt Lake City, killing one man and causing millions of dollars in damage. I cannot believe what has just happened. A tornado has gone through downtown Salt Lake. It started just southwest of the Delta Center. It has ripped the roof off the Delta Center. Oh my goodness. It has gone into the, I don't know if it's the Double Tree anymore, but it's the hotel that's right across. Oh my God! It's right across the street from here. I can't breathe! The triad jitter. It has now moved. The tornado has now lifted, lifting back up in the sky, but it has gone clear across just to the east of the Triad Center, Look at across the, fires. the parking lot place by the genealogical library, just behind the genealogical library. The tornado has now lifted off, but it has done some major damage here in downtown Salt Lake City. The tornado was about, uh, well, it started about 10 minutes ago. I couldn't help but privately note the symbolism, as in just two weeks, I too would fly somewhere over the rainbow to a land called Oz. Ha, 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 ha.